Eight years, six months, and 18 days. That's how long Guts and the crew were on Roderick's boat. Despite a blistering pace for the first 20 years of its run, the release schedule for Berserk became more and more sporadic after the conclusion of the Falcon of the Millennium Empire arc. In addition, the community began to wonder if Mira had written himself into a creative dead end and was merely at a loss as to how to tie up all the loose ends of the ongoing story. But in my opinion, there was a larger narrative at play that was not only critical to the story, but to Guts' plight as a character. To understand what I am talking about, we need to address the concept of depression and how it affects men and women in completely different ways. After Guts and Casca suffered the greatest psychological trauma of their lives, each one descended into a pit of despair, a depression that neither one could escape. But wait a minute, how is it possible that Guts and Casca suffered from the same ailment when they presented with vastly different symptoms? It's due to the fact that depression affects men and women in vastly different ways. For women, the incidence of depression is twice as high as men. However, women's symptoms are more easily recognizable as depressive. Such symptoms include persistent sadness, hopelessness, feelings of guilt, and a loss of interest. Because we can easily discern these trademark indicators, women can more easily identify the root cause of their condition and seek the appropriate care. When men are depressed, however, they present with symptoms that don't seem like depression upon first glance i.e. anger, aggressiveness, engaging in high-risk activities, not being able to sleep, and physical aches slash pains. The difference in symptoms between the genders is so stark that numerous men cannot identify the root cause of their debilitating mental illness. Furthermore, men tend to conceal their feelings from others due to their pride, ingrained social norms, or the simple fact they don't understand the feelings themselves. Thus far, we've provided a basis for what depression is, and its idiosyncratic manifestations in men and women. Now, if we overlay these symptoms on Guts and Casca, it matches up quite well with their changes in personality after the events of the eclipse. Now, equating Casca's regression into an adolescent with depression may sound a bit strange, but I believe Mira used symbolism to great effect to emphasize her state of mind. For example, in her infantile state, Casca is useless to others, has no interest in fighting or interacting with her past lover, and is often sad when she cannot hold her child. While Guts's depressive symptoms more directly coincide with the standard definitions for men, Mira also used a fair amount of symbolism with the Black Swordsman to clarify his internal psychology. After the eclipse, Guts displays a ferocious rage, is aggressive in his plight to chase down Griffith, and kills anyone who gets in his way. And obviously, he engages in high-risk activities by challenging ever bigger and stronger apostles. With the brand of sacrifice on his neck, he gets little to no sleep and is often in physical pain. He also experiences reoccurring nightmares that cause him emotional stress. The reason these symptoms proliferate in Guts and begin to run roughshod over his life is because he neglected the corrupting influences on his psyche. He neglected his own inner shadow, which allowed it to grow in size and scope, to eventually haunt and manipulate him. Man, however, is the most courageous animal. Thereby hath he overcome every animal. With sound of triumph hath he overcome every pain. Human pain, however, is the sorest pain. Pain of the soul, of the mind, is a lingering ailment that cannot be dealt with in an external fashion. It requires one to fully engage with their self and take on the task of a lifetime via delving deep within themselves. To a place that we not only hide from others, but from ourselves. No one wants to admit they're a work in progress. A repository of indelible memories that re-emerge when we least expect it. Depression is like an invitation, a banquet of the soul in which every facet of yourself is on the platter. Do you want everything your soul has to offer? Can you accept it all in stride? Or will it become an emetic that you run away from? Can you stomach yourself? Depression is a primary signal the body uses to get your attention. Just as you feel a rush of adrenaline when your body is in a stressful state, so does your body send warning signals when you are not fulfilling certain requirements for a healthier state of mind. 
In a way, it's like a check engine light of your psyche. A reminder that we need to evaluate ourselves and reconcile precipitous elements within us so that we can create a sense of meaning within our lives. Jung saw depression as an introverted condition. That is to say, withdrawing one's libido, which can be viewed as desire or impulse, not purely sexual energy, from the conscious world and turning it inward, resulting in depression and anxiety. For example, in the modern social environment, with the advent of social media and the restriction of acceptable opinions, numerous people have been hampered by depression. Now it may sound paradoxical at first, considering that we are more quote-unquote connected than ever. But in this new age world, people are only showcasing the quote-unquote best of themselves and pretending their lives are perfect. We live in a persona-driven society that demands perpetual happiness and moral flawlessness. Opinions that deviate from the landscape of appropriateness are censored, banned, or ostracized. Hence, the herd dictates the moral code through a facade of virtuous superiority to keep others subservient and intellectually impoverished. What if a regressive trait lurked in the good man? Likewise a danger, an enticement, a poison, a narcotic, so that the present lived at the expense of the future, perhaps in more comfort and less danger, but also in a smaller-minded, meaner way so that morality itself were to blame if man never attained the highest power and splendor possible for that type of man, so that morality itself was the danger of dangers. With the modern predicament of locking one's innermost feelings into a cave of darkness, it's only a matter of time before the collection of desires slash drives begin to swell in one's soul and seek external acknowledgement. Hence men experience the classic depressive symptoms we acknowledged earlier. In addition, it has engendered outrage through social media platforms, which is no surprise. Because when the general populace seeks an immaculate persona, it creates the inner enantiodromia, or opposite, which is a savage narcissist who cannot tolerate individuals who seek excellence, who seek greatness, who seek the future. The most common form of despair is not being who you are. Finally, this is what's most terrible of all. The concept of the good man signifies that one sides with all that is weak, sick, failure, suffering of itself. All that ought to perish. The principle of selection is crossed. An ideal is fabricated from the contradiction against the proud and well-turned-out human being who says yes, who is sure of the future, who guarantees the future, and he is now called evil. And all this was believed as morality. With the advent of social media, the epoch of virtue signaling is in full swing. But is it possible it existed long before this? Perhaps under the noses of past generations, cleverly disguised as piety and temperance. It was Christianity which painted the devil on the world's walls. It was Christianity which first brought sin into the world. Belief in the cure which it offered has now been shaken to its deepest roots. But belief in the sickness which it taught and propagated continues to exist. We may liken this description to Farnese and the Holy See, and how they've sanitized the world from what they deem to be evil. Burn the iniquitous, save for themselves, for they are the morally absolute. Sure, they're not gods, but they are enacting a perverted vision of God's will, which gives them superiority over the rabble. Take note of the fact that each disciple of Mosgus is an outcast a lesser quality of man, placing them in the basement of the social hierarchy. Because of their weakness, Mosgus intentionally targeted them, knowing full well they desperately sought a higher place in society, a place where they could wield power, thus permitting their scorn to externalize into the physical world through various kinds of torture. Despite her ambivalence to the cruder forms of persecution, Farnese went along with blind faith. The Holy See doctrine demanded a stringent lifestyle that negated life itself via suppressing everything that makes us rough, sharp, animalistic, and great. Meekness is health. Excellence is blasphemy. They turn the cheek, live a modest lifestyle, and promote love and understanding. However, Nietzsche claimed these practices were a thinly veiled disguise to conceal one's antipathy to the strong. A calculated subterfuge for the inferior to upend the hierarchy so they could claim a top spot for themselves. 
Only those who suffer are good. Only the poor, the powerless, the lowly are good. The suffering, the deprived, the sick, the ugly are the only pious people. The only ones saved. Salvation is for them alone. Whereas you rich, the noble and powerful, you eternally wicked, cruel, lustful, insatiate, godless, you will be eternally wretched, cursed, and damned. When Mosgus and his disciples are destroyed by guts, Farnese's sense of usefulness dissolves away. What was left was an empty spirit, hence the reason she hides in a hollowed-out tree. Because this represents her soul, the soul that she burned away by burning other people. This is what Nietzsche espoused, that excessively religious people are perverting the word of God for their own sociological gains. They are more concerned with punishing others than looking at themselves in the mirror. They speak of damnation because damnation lives in their hearts. And as we know from Carl Jung, if one does not draw upon the psychological contents of their inner world, they project them onto others, when in reality, it is them who need to reconcile their own demons. As an alternative to this mindset, Nietzsche urged people to strive for greatness, to transcend their capabilities, and create a new system of values that embolden the greatness in man. God was dead in Nietzsche's philosophical framework, which meant that people had three paths to go from here. Number 1. Nihilism A state in which one is depressed, seeing only pain and suffering in life, a proliferating sentiment in the modern epoch. Number 2. The replacement of God with the state An equally troubling issue in which people become politically divided and see the other side as wicked, an offshoot of religious moralization. And then 3. The creation of new values via individual achievement, i.e. becoming the higher man or the Ubermensch. Guts, Casca, and Farnese, despite their divergent personalities, fall under the first category. Guts believes he lives in a godless world, hence he kills incessantly because nothing else matters. If there is no god, everything is permitted. Casca, in her adolescent state of mind, is happy-go-lucky without a care in the world. This would be equivalent to Nietzsche's last man, someone who simply tunes out from the world and only wishes to live in comfort and happiness. In the modern culture, this would be akin to binging television, video games, or social media in an excessive fashion. Activities that offer transient bliss, but no long-term satisfaction. The last man revels in small pleasures, blends in with the herd, is the perpetual quote-unquote victim, and adopts moral relativism, seeing everything as trivial and arbitrary. Their mind is in a state of idleness, much like Casca's post-eclipse, and are merely watching from a distance. The earth has become small, and on it hops the last man, who makes everything small. His species is ineradicable as the flea. The last man lives the longest. We have discovered happiness, say the last men, and they blink. Farnese is depressed due to her religious morality crumbling under her feet. With the death of God, as it were, she had nothing else to grasp onto. She henceforth fell into an abyss of loneliness, a frightened state of mind that yielded nothing of consequence. Rather, it became a hindrance more than anything else. Therefore, each one of the three were in need of a journey, a reconciliation of the inner divisions created by external travesties, an open communication with God, that is to say, the gods that exist within the archetypes, which exist in a person's psyche an essential task in mending psychological disturbances. A church is a sanctuary where people communicate with angels or spirits. A magician constructs a sanctuary within her mind. Suffice it to say, Guts, Casca, and Farnese have not yet constructed their inner sanctuaries, which meant they were metaphorically running away from the task, running away from the inner god. Similarly, in the biblical story of Jonah and the whale, Jonah evades God's call to action by escaping onto a ship. Angered by his disobedience, God produces a violent storm. In previous videos, I mentioned how large bodies of water are representative of the unconscious, due to their immense depth and dark waters. In Jonah's story, because he ignored God, i.e. his collective unconscious, it revolted against him, becoming turbulent and unyielding. This mirrors Gut's struggle with his inner beast of darkness, and how each battle lures him into the depths of his soul. 
Mythologically, the hero's goal is to find the treasure, the princess, the ring, the golden egg, the elixir of life. Psychologically, these are metaphor for one's true feelings and unique potential. In the process of individuation, the heroic task is to assimilate unconscious contents, as opposed to being overwhelmed by them. The potential result is the release of energy that has been tied up with the unconscious complexes. After Jonah was tossed aboard, the waters became calm again. God then sent a large whale to swallow Jonah, where he stayed for three days and three nights. In this area of stasis, Jonah prayed to the Lord. From deep in the realm of the dead I called for help. You hurled me into the depths, into the heart of the seas. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. The belly of the whale represents a state of depression and nihilism. It is a place where we cut ourselves off from the rest of the world for what may feel like years. It's an imposition from the unconscious to rein in the ego consciousness. Reintegrate suppressed emotions that lie dormant. For Guts, this experience happens when he enters into the mouth of the sea god. Interestingly enough, he did this while wearing his berserker armor, which is an outward manifestation of his unconscious. Meaning, his unconscious directed him into the belly of the whale, just as Jonah was directed by God, who manifests in the collective unconscious. Guts eventually makes his way into the cavity where the heart is located. It's a sea god, all right. This feels like the ocean floor. The undifferentiated psyche prior to the emergence of the ego consciousness. If one inspects this image closely, you'll notice a heart concealed by the eels. A heart that has eyes on it. Now where have we seen this before? The darkness that dwells in every human heart. The idea of evil. This is God. I dwell deep in your heart. I am part of you. You are a part of your kind's consciousness. A part of me. Your desire is my desire as well. Guts begins slicing the eels, symbolically breaking his own cyclical nature. In the future, this will permit upward growth, like a spiral, that seeks to achieve higher levels of consciousness. He then lunges for the heart, but the massive organ pushes him back. In Chapter 324, Mira accentuates the eyes of the god and Guts. Closer examination reveals that only Guts' left eye is drawn, which is controlled by the right brain. The right brain is the Dynesian side. That is to say, the impulsive, wild, and animalistic portion. The heart of the psyche, as it were. God has fallen out of containment in religion and into human hearts. God is incarnating. Our whole consciousness is in an uproar from the God who wants to know and to be known. Now I know Guts lost his right eye to an apostle during the eclipse, but Mira made it a point to cover his right eye in shadows. The eye controlled by the Apollonian brain, that is. Indicating that Guts has neglected his rational, caring, and ordered values. But to reverse course, Guts needed to fully submerge himself into the deepest layers of his unconscious. Confront what he had become, and destroy it. Why, you may ask, would Guts want to destroy himself? Because, simply put, he had become the outward projection of the idea of evil. I am this world, the darkness that dwells in every human heart. Guts feared a trip to the black swells of his unconscious, yet his body intrinsically knew it was necessary. He could no longer embody the collective swells of fury that dwelled in his heart. Otherwise, the eruptions of anger would rip his psyche asunder. Rather than allowing the evil to consume him, he needed to subdue it into submission, so that it would no longer define him. This is the point of the night sea journey, to be born into yourself. There, you are in the amniotic fluid, in the alchemic substance once again. You are journeying toward your own life. You are preparing for your fate. The promise is exhilarating, but the dangers are extreme. You have to avoid being just one of the crowd, and instead take the chance of being born an individual. Gut slashes the vital organ, the world of the inner psyche, and is forcibly submerged into a baptism of the soul. A second birth, as it were. The first one being under the tree into the physical world, and the second being his spiritual birth as an individual. Unlike baptism nowadays that are innocuous affairs, and more for show than anything else, 
Baptisms resembled death, a total immersion. A figurative death was represented, which really meant drowning. A forced drowning of the soul is necessary in the process of individuation, for it promotes one to humble themselves in the presence of the overwhelming psychological energy. The contents of the unconscious are immense. Plunging deeper increases the pressure on the soul. Little by little, the ego consciousness becomes paralyzed by the realization that it has little control in the presence of the all-pervasive oceans of the soul. Complete submersion humbles the quote-unquote I, the individual, elucidating the truth that we do not wish to admit. And the more we neglect this pressing fact, the further we sink into ourselves. Futility eventually sets in, darkness envelops the soul, and despair is the only solace. I cannot see anything. Is it because it's dark? Or is it my eyes? My arms? Legs? I can just barely feel them. I guess that's the berserker armor. The shadow. For you. However, just when all hope seems lost. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened up and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Just as Jesus becomes an individual he is destined through the second birth, so does Guts become born again through his battle with the ancient God of his soul. Instead of being crushed by the weight of the water, i.e. his emotions, instincts, and feelings, he was regenerated with a newfound relationship with himself, a relationship with the God inside his soul. The luminous body of the Moonlight Boy which serves as the Holy Ghost slash Spirit, provides life breath to Guts by directing him upward and outward toward the conscious world, towards his second birth. It seems to me to be the Holy Spirit's task and charge to reconcile and unite the opposites in the human individual through a special development of the human soul. Guts uses the last of his strength to escape, but he needed the assistance of mermaids to reach the water's surface. Now why would this be? To understand this, we need to broach the topic of Melusine and Maros slash mermaids. As I discussed in my Griffith analysis video, Hermes slash Mercurius is a perfect representation for the self, as he exists in heaven but has the ability to travel to the Thonic realms, thus uniting the opposites of good and evil. Melusine is a female version of the archetypal self alluring beauty and grotesque serpent, caring mother and siren of death, who lures nearby sailors with her enchanting music to shipwreck, healer and psychopomp or soul guide in the afterlife, half human consciousness and half mythological unconsciousness. Paracelsus, a Swiss physician and alchemist, alleged that Melusine was seduced by Beelzebub into practicing magic. She originated from the whale from where Jonah journeyed for three days and three nights. Hence, she derives from the womb of mysteries, the womb of Guts' second birth, from the unconscious of the psyche. She also symbolizes an anima figure, i.e. a feminine portion of the male brain. Guts neglected his own feminine aspects, the caring, nurturing, loving aspects of his psyche, to which he became disassociated from. If you pay attention, you will see that the most masculine man has a feminine soul. The more manly you are, the more remote from you is what woman really is, since the feminine in yourself is alien and contemptuous. The acceptance of femininity leads to completion. Guts' pugnacious attitude towards Casca in the Golden Age arc, prior to their relationship, was a hindrance to his psychological growth. It became worse after the events of the Eclipse, tearing his ego consciousness asunder from the feminine aspects of his soul. The anima as an unconscious phenomena is an autonomous complex that compels men to be hypersensitive to their emotional triggers, resulting in emotional outbursts that have no rational basis. Although Guts is a masculine chad par excellence, he fails to heed Godot's advice. He forgets to check up on Casca to assure her safety and he cannot bear to express his inner emotions to anyone except for his rage. In rebellion to this suppression, Guts' anima lashes back with intense fury. This is personified through Casca's resentment when her ego consciousness is in stasis. In fact, after the eclipse, Guts' relationship with women is increasingly distasteful. 
It's no surprise that after the eclipse, we see Guts mercilessly fighting a female apostle. His relationship with Jill during the Lost Children chapters is strained. He provokes and ridicules Farnese and treats Casca as his property. In effect, Guts has bound up the feminine aspects of his soul. And the more she resists him, the more he contemplates strangling and killing her. Much of this changes when Shirka enters Guts' psyche and begins to temper the iniquitous thoughts slash feelings. However, Guts' shadow, Beast of Darkness, is still resistant. But he takes a huge step forward when he places his faith in the mermaids to save his life. More than this, actually, they lift Guts' body into his second birth. Notice how Guts' physical birth came from a dead woman, causing his body to descend into a pool of blood and amniotic fluid. By contrast, his second birth comes from the blood and fluid of the sea god, and ends with women lifting his body into the new realm of consciousness. Symbolically, Guts compressed his anima into the subterranean layers of his soul. But now she's coming to the surface again, to be reintegrated into the light of consciousness. The Eternal Feminine draws us on high. With the integration of his anima, Guts is more in tune with his inner feelings, and even thanks Serpico for all his help, a gesture that would have been unthinkable for the Black Swordsman during the earlier arcs. He places his faith in Shirka and Farnese in recovering Casca's lost memories. Speaking of the former leader of the Holy Iron Chain Knights, she discovered a new sense of usefulness via becoming Casca's protector. The simple task pulled her out of her funk, eliminating the existential armor from her body. She found joy in nurturing her quote-unquote little sister, joy in standing on her own two feet, and joy in becoming more basic, which is not a slight in any regard. Activities that bring us back to our primal roots, like camping, physical activity, and playing in water, externalize the libido in a healthy manner. Engaging in simple activities reveals hidden aspects of ourselves. It gives us an opportunity to learn more about ourselves and recognize that the trifling affairs that exist in our lives should not have influence over our happiness. When one finds themselves in psychological destitution, they should seek tasks that make them valuable to others. Through this commitment, one will begin to find their inner strength, which will define their life. He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Little by little, the why can expand into ever greater responsibilities. Just as Farnese eventually gains the confidence to ask Shirka to teach her how to use magic, which gives her the ability to protect Roderick's boat from harm's way. The boat journey was the resolution of these three characters' battle with depression. Guts confronted what he had hidden from others and made it conscious. Farnese became helpful to others, which gave her life direction. And Casca was transported to the place where she would eventually resolve her own inner strife. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned how the boat arc took 8 years, 6 months, and 18 days. And I believe the reason this happened was because Mira was going through his own depression, his own bouts of inner strife. Hence the reason he was losing interest in the story by delaying future chapters. Artists are not immune to unconsciously conveying their inner feelings on the page. And Mira even admitted in an interview that Griffith is based on a mangaka that he knew growing up in his college days. Therefore, we can assume that Mira self-identifies with Guts, as pretty much any author does with their main protagonist, and transposes his inner feelings and struggles on the Guts' personality. Given the early rage in the manga, we can assume Mira was resisting his own inner turmoil. The boat arc, thusly, is a meta-reference to the mangaka's internal psychology. Mira couldn't get off the boat until he reconciled the venomous energies within his soul. He undertook a perilous journey in which he avoided being defeated by the darkness of his soul, the domination of the unconscious over the consciousness. And for him, he must have felt disconnected from the world. What was years for us was probably decades for Mira. Hence the time distortion on Elfhelm, where time goes slower for its inhabitants than the rest of the world. The whole arc is a metaphor for depression itself. With the elongated release schedule, the references to Jonah and the whale, and the ongoing character arcs we discussed earlier. While it was depressing waiting for the chapters to be released, in hindsight, it was emblematic of the disorder itself. In myth and legend, the hero typically travels by ship, fights a sea monster, is swallowed, struggles against being bitten or crushed to death, and having arrived inside the belly of the whale, 
like Jonah, seeks the vital organ and cuts it off, thereby winning release. Eventually, he must return to his beginnings and bear witness. To ensure his future sanity, Guts must tend to his psyche like a plant, care for it, nurture it, grow it, and pay attention to it. Otherwise, he'll follow the same fate as Jonah. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about the plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight.